Hi there, I'm Jen, this is Remembered Reads, and this is going to be my wrap-up of the past week or so in reading. The first thing that I read during this past week was Sam Keen's The Tale of the Dueling Neurosurgeons. The subheading on this one is the history of the human brain as revealed through stories of trauma, madness, and recovery. This looks very broadly at the history of discoveries in brain science based on a variety of case studies, starting with basically Henry II of France through to some more recent finds. The title comes from an idea that gets dropped earlier on than I had hoped it would, which is that a lot of discoveries were made simultaneously. So for example, at one point, there's a discussion of discoveries that were happening during the First World War, and basically specific types of injuries that were being documented simultaneously in the UK and in Japan. So these were groups of neuroscientists, or proto-neuroscientists, because that wasn't really what they were calling themselves in those days, who were doing the same work and coming to the same findings at pretty much exactly the same time on opposite sides of the world. Obviously in cases like that, they're not actually dueling. The author does go into some points where you have two people who are debating, for example, localization and language, and he talks about when Broca's area was first named and labeled and Wernicke's area and so on. But with a lot of it, it's not necessarily people at odds with each, with each other. And in a number of the chapters, there aren't even the two parallel journeys. Because it is doing looking at so many cases over such a long period, none of the bits in here are particularly in-depth. So if you are familiar with some of the individual cases, this is not as interesting as I think it would be if you were a pure beginner and completely new to all of this. Because immediately prior to this, I had been reading a memoir of one of the split brain researchers, and about a month ago I had read a book that was specifically looking at patient HM and a couple of other amnesia cases. So when you get to chapters like that in here, it is just less interesting because just coming off having read the more in-depth pieces, it's hard for this to live up to that. So by the nature of the writing, this has to be more general. So I didn't find that quite as interesting. But as a grand overview, I think this was quite successful in what it was trying to do. So while I was reading that, I was also listening to an audiobook around the same time, and that is Oliver Sacks' Musicophilia, which is read by Simon Preble. Each of the individual chapters in here are not quite as in-depth as I think you might expect if you've read other books by Oliver Sacks, which tend to be, here's a chapter about one very interesting patient. Instead, this tends to say, here's one phenomenon where we know that a certain part of the brain or a certain type of brain injury affects appreciation of music or musical ability or musical recognition or musical hallucinations, so on and so forth. And then he describes a number of either patient case studies or sometimes just correspondences that he had with people who experienced either those conditions or those hallucinations or sudden musical gifts, so on and so forth. Because it never gets particularly deep into anything, I think it could be a little bit unsatisfying if you were coming to this hoping it was another book like The Man Who Mistook His Wife for the Hat or Awakenings or something like that where it's more specifically descriptions of interesting patient studies. But I did really actually end up quite enjoying this despite the fact that it didn't really dig down into anything because it was so specifically about how music affects a variety of different conditions that you might normally look at in other ways. I do think this was this actually makes a great pairing with any kind of general look at cognitive psychology or neuroscience because it is very specific in a very broad way and so I think it would pair nicely with something that is very broad. So, for example, something like this might be a very good natural pairing to this. I did think it was interesting to be reading both of these simultaneously, since a lot of the injuries and conditions that are talked about from a musical perspective in this do get touched on in the other book in a more general way. And after listening to that, I thought I'd see if my library had any other audiobooks of Oliver Sacks' writing. And they did have his memoir about his own life, which is called On the Move. I listened to about the first 20 minutes of this and I had to quit listening to it because this is read by, I think his name is Dan Woden, who is an American with a very kind of flat Midwestern American accent. And I found that to be a huge disconnect to have him reading first person Oliver Sacks' memoir about being a child and moving out of London during the Blitz and then going back and his this very 
English experience with this very flat American accent was too much of a disconnect for me, so I had to put that one down. So after that, I read Moonwalking with Einstein by Joshua Four. Joshua Four is a journalist who had covered the US national and the international memory competitions, and having done that, he decided to give it a go himself. And he worked at these memorization and mnemonic techniques for a year and did become the US champion for a year. And he went on to the world championships. He didn't finish as well as he did at the US championships, but still did not embarrass himself. So this is both an overview of memory competitions, a memoir of his year of doing that, as well as looking at individual bits of the science of memory. He, there's one chapter where he talks about amnesia. Interestingly, he uses patient EP for that and doesn't talk about either HM or Clive Wearing, which just about every other book that I've talked about for the past little while has talked about one or both of them. So I thought that was interesting. He talks a lot about the ancient Greeks and their methods for memorization and how the development of writing and then the printing press and now the fact that you can have anything on your tablet or phone and don't need to memorize anything basically has changed the value of memorization. So all of that is very interesting. This is another one where it deals with so many things that you don't get a single in-depth look at anything. And when I was looking at the reviews of this on Goodreads, I saw a few people who had hoped that this was actually teaching mnemonic tricks, and that is not what this is. So I wouldn't go into this expecting something like that. I definitely did think it was interesting. I had no idea about these memory competitions before, so I definitely thought that was enlightening. And it did definitely show how, if you're impressed by memory tricks, it is definitely possible to train yourself to do something like that. So I thought that was interesting. Simultaneously with that one, I was also reading this short memoir by Mark Lukash, which is My Lovely Wife in the Psych Ward, which is his memoir of his relationship with his wife, who has been hospitalized for psychosis a few times. She was initially given a diagnosis of schizophrenia, it was later changed to bipolar, and it's a super short book, so it was one that wasn't difficult to go through. It was not super compelling. It is very much, despite the fact that I'm talking about it in terms of his wife's experience, it's very much about his experience as her caretaker. He was a stay-at-home parent with their child, and she was the primary wage earner in the household, which I think made things a little more complicated. He comes off as very irritated through the story. He talks early on about how charmed his life had been up to that point, and I think because of that, I don't think anyone is ever prepared for their spouse to become psychotic, but it seems like he was even less well prepared, but instead of being sad or even really angry about it, he just sounds irritated with the inconvenience of it a lot of the time, which I'm sure is probably honest, but it was strange to read and I felt felt like I wanted to know A, more about his wife, and B, yeah, I didn't know how to feel about his irritation, which seemed very, again, probably honest, but not super compelling. It, it just it made him feel very unsympathetic, and I feel like I don't know anything about his wife except that he was irritated with her. I mean, and she's Italian. So I didn't personally find it compelling. I think maybe if you were caring for someone who is going through a psychotic break and you are frustrated, it might feel like it might be nice to read that and feel like you're communing with someone who understands that feeling. But I think if your feelings were not irritation, I don't know how compelling that would be. But yeah, it, uh, I guess it is what it is and it's super short. So, and finally, speaking of super short, I also read Jill Bolt Taylor's My Stroke of Insight. As the subheading says, a brain scientist's personal journey. So she was someone who worked in the field of neuroscience and then had a stroke at the age of 37 and pretty much completely recovered over a period of seven years. The book has three main sections. It has a bit of an introduction both to her work and to basics of neuroscience. It has a section about her experience of the stroke on the day and in the immediate weeks and months afterwards. And I think that middle section was fascinating. That is definitely an impressive read and very enlightening. The final part gets into sort of woo-woo spiritual territory. Because of the nature of brain damage that she had, the part of her brain that stayed most functional during the point where she was most impaired was the same part of the brain that when they've done scans of, for example, 
Buddhist monks and Catholic nuns, so from a variety of religious traditions, when they are praying or meditating, there's a certain part of the brain that is more active. So that was more active in her at that point. So she framed a lot of her stroke experience in a new age spiritual sense, because that was her singing in the woods kind of spirituality before the stroke. And while I think that might be interesting if you wanted to approach it from that kind of spiritual position, but I didn't find that particularly compelling. And I think in that part, there's a, a bigger blending of her personal experience without the backing of fact to it, which again is fine. This is obviously primarily a memoir, but because it sets it itself up as sharing something that is specifically about having a stroke and, and the rehabilitation afterwards, which is very general, to have something that specific at the end was a little bit startling. But I mean, I definitely think this is worth reading for that middle section, which does a great job of describing a time without language. This also includes a bunch of lists of how to detect a stroke and of suggestions for caregivers, which I think is useful if you know someone who either has risk factors, it might be good to have the list of things to look for so that one can detect this early and not wait too long because the longer you wait, the more damage is created. So that I think is, is worth having. And I think if you're caring for someone who has just had a stroke, this could be quite inspiring, both in that it gives you tips of what to do or how to think about things. And, but I do think it could be frustrating if you are, either you or someone you're looking after is later in the recovery and hasn't had as thorough a recovery as she did. One thing that I didn't like about this is that she repeatedly talks about being irritated with doctors and nurses and other medical staff who don't respect her at times when she was nonverbal or barely verbal. And her insistence is always, I'm not stupid, so respect me. And I felt like that was an unfortunate thing. And she actually puts that in, on the list of when you're caring for someone, know that they're not stupid. But I felt like even if someone is stupid, you should still respect them. I was really unhappy to see that. I felt like it was the opposite. I talked about the memoir Ghost Boy last week and about how the author of that made the point that when people were mistreating him in a care home, it wasn't wrong because he was intelligent. It was wrong because you shouldn't treat someone like that, even if they do have an IQ under 30. And she seems to think that if you aren't very bright, it's okay for people not to respect you. And I was appalled by that. That said, I do think this is probably very useful. That said, I do think this is a really interesting look at the experience of someone describing having a stroke like that. And I do think this is certainly valuable for that middle section and possibly the introductory section too, if you want to read some very basic basics. <laughs> All right, so that was my week, my week in reading about the brain, apparently. <laughs> I'm not sure how much more brain content I want to read about now, although I still have a stack, so we'll see how that goes. Anyway, I hope your week has been going well and uh, I'm looking forward to everybody's Friday Reads videos tomorrow. That's it for now. Ciao.